Hello there! I just wanted to come on and do a quick video for those of you who might be curious what books I've been reading lately. Only one of these is a book I actually own, which is a book I asked for for Christmas a couple years ago. It is The Trouble with Kings by Sherwood Smith, which is a, I guess, young adult historical fiction story about a princess who keeps getting abducted. It's better than it sounds based on that really poor description I just gave, and definitely better than this cheesy cover implies. Sherwood Smith's most famous book thus far is Court Duel, also known as a duology, Crown Duel and Court Duel, which I was introduced to by a friend a couple years ago. I really enjoyed that book, and in certain ways, The Trouble with Kings reminded me of it. The medievalish fantasy setting where magic is present, but it's not really a major part of the book, it's just there on the fringes. Also, all the court intrigue and diplomatic duplicity, something the heroine abhors and wants to avoid. The heroine in this book, the princess, is the center of attention because of her important position, but that's pretty much it. She isn't popular or stylish, and she's way more interested in music than is considered fashionable. So even though she's a princess and a potential queen, she doesn't have a lot of fans in her own kingdom. But on the other hand, she does make for a relatable, likable protagonist, and she grows a lot wiser over the course of the story, which I thought was one of the book's greatest strengths. And I'm not complaining about the romantic angle either, as was the case with Court Duel. The romantic lead kind of sneaks up on you, which is fun. The book is a little heavy-handed at times with unnecessary details. Not that it's especially long, it's only uh, 300... 325 pages, um, but it does have some some tangents where you're reading it and you're making a mental note of this thing because you feel like it's going to be important later on and then it's never spoken of again, and that's a little bit frustrating. But that really didn't deter me that much. This was an entertaining, swashbuckler type story with romance and adventure and a collection of questionable side characters. I also read, sorry, I have a scratch, I also read Major Pettigrew's Last Stand by Helen Simonson. My pithy personal review of this one was that it was similar to, but not as funny as, A Man Called Ova by Frederick Bachman. This one is about a career military man, British, now retired, also a widower. Though he is very old-fashioned and deeply rooted in tradition and personal habit, he unexpectedly finds himself at odds with his community when he strikes up a friendship with a local Pakistani woman. It's one of those stories that is both humorous and sad, often simultaneously, which is confusing for your face because you don't know if you're supposed to be laughing or crying. I've said before that I often click with crotchety older characters like this who bristle against the so-called modern conveniences of the 21st century, but on the flip side, I didn't find the major as endearing as I think perhaps I was supposed to. He is a lot like Ova in certain ways, so much so that I wondered which came first, so I looked it up and it turns out that this book was actually published two years, I think, before Bachman's Swedish bestseller, so that's interesting. But I read that one first, so there you go. Both books are about an older man struggling with the changing of the times and the softening of a cold, lonely heart. I guess I just slightly preferred the thawing process in A Man Called Ova. Nearly all the books that I'm talking about here, with one exception, are ones that I've been meaning to get to for at least a year, if not longer. That includes this one, Heartless by Marissa Meyer, and this is a book that I feel kind of sheepish talking about because I was so ridiculously slow to figure it out. It's an origin story for the Queen of Hearts from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. This is not a spoiler, it tells you so up front, it's written on the inside blurb, it's on the little thing about it on Goodreads, sometimes it's even on the front cover. It's not supposed to be a surprise, but somehow I completely missed this major point. I just thought it was a book about a girl living in Wonderland who everyone expects is going to marry the king, but secretly she wants to open a bakery business, and then she falls in love with the king's jester. 
At a certain point, of course, it became unavoidably obvious what was happening, and then I felt really stupid for having been like, oh, this book is so fun, and it's romantic, and clever, and I love all the things that she did here, but wow, it's, it's kind of dark at this point, isn't it? Woo. My excuse is that it's been a couple years since I looked at a physical copy or read a blurb of what the book was about. So yes, it gets dark, and then it keeps getting darker, which makes perfect sense if you're not me and you know where the story is headed. After the fact, once the light bulb finally flickered on above my head, I really appreciated how crafty Marissa Meyer was in pulling this off. The Lunar Chronicles were great, I loved that series, and I would say that this standalone novel is pretty much on the same level. Perhaps it's less complex in terms of world building, but still complicated. And did I mention it gets dark? References to Lewis Carroll's material, both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, which I read a very long time ago and probably didn't understand as much as I could have, are smoothly integrated with Meyer's own inventions, making it a satisfying read. I enjoy seeing how she takes things readers are familiar with already and makes them her own, while also finding new ways to be creative and entertaining. So please, don't interpret my obtuseness as a sign that she did a poor job with this reimagining. After that, I read another one that was also kind of dark, The Cuckoo's Calling by Robert Galbraith, which is a pen name for J.K. Rowling. I feel like I should say right at the start here, even though I don't really want to get into it, that I'm not a particular fan of J.K. Rowling. I did not read Harry Potter as a kid, unlike so many other people that I grew up with. Um, and while I did start reading the series a few years ago because I felt like I ought to, um, I wasn't enamored with it and I only made it through the first five. I really don't feel motivated to continue and finish the series. I know it's like, you've only got two left, but those are two fat books and I just, I don't have any inclination. I already know what happens, so there's no incentive there. And I just, uh, that's just how I feel. I have so many other things that I want to read. So, now that I've lost a good portion of my audience by telling you all that, <laughs> but what I did read a lot of growing up were murder mysteries. While all my friends were rereading Harry Potter for the umpteenth time, I was devouring Agatha Christie like a fiend. And since that's what this book is, essentially, it stood a better chance of holding my interest than a fantasy series, which isn't really my thing. This is the first Cormoran Strike book, and I liked it, mostly. I actually ended up not caring about the murder case itself so much, but I did find the two main characters interesting, Strike, who's a war vet turned private detective, and his supposed-to-be temporary secretary, Robin. Um, I think I liked them enough to want to read more of the series. There are three other books currently written. I've heard that Rowling wants to write like ten more. I don't know if that's gonna happen. The mystery, by the way, wasn't bad. It was more the setting of it with high-profile rich people and celebrities that I didn't really care for. Um, I did have some stuff figured out early on, but then the twists and turns made me second-guess myself which was most likely the author's intent. It did have more language than I care to read, and at one point Strike does the stupid thing that so many detectives do that always drives me crazy because I just feel like this is so unprofessional, but I might continue the series anyway. I might not. I don't know. <laughs> Another book I read, which is the only one on the list that I hadn't been anticipating for a long time, this was more of an impulse read, was Dear Fahrenheit 451, Love and Heartbreak in the Stacks by Annie Spence. Annie Spence is a librarian, and this is mostly a collection of humorous and personal letters written to various books, both fiction and nonfiction, including ones that she's loved to pieces, ones that she hated, and ones that she's ignored. Sometimes it was funny, sometimes it was just okay. The writing is very informal, sometimes landing on the juvenile side of things, which of course counteracts that old stereotype of the stiff staid librarian. I did get some recommendations out of it, as well as some tips on books to avoid. 
but I probably never would have read them in the first place. So I guess I got what I was looking for from the book. And lastly, I decided to take the plunge and read The Interrupted Journey by John G. Fuller. Thank goodness the copy I got, which looked exactly like this, didn't have an alien on the cover. I was very nervous about that. This is the follow-up book to Fuller's Incident at Exeter, the UFO book that I talked about a few months ago that examines a series of sightings in New Hampshire in 1966. As Fuller was concluding his investigations, he heard about the case of Barney and Betty Hill, a New Hampshire couple who had had two strange experiences on their drive home a few years earlier. One was a UFO sighting, but the other they had no recollection of except for a span of time they couldn't account for until the encounter, an apparent abduction, was revealed to them months later under hypnosis. I thought Incident at Exeter was a spooky read, so needless to say, I was hesitant to check this one out, and it did deliver some frightening and alarming moments. But the book, the bulk of which is made up of transcriptions from the hypnosis tapes, wasn't as scary as I feared it would be. Well, parts of it were, but not the whole thing. Um, thanks largely, I think, to its orderly and sometimes repetitive structure. And while Barney's first session contained some very disturbing emotional moments, Betty's session actually contained some surprising revelations that subverted my expectations. It's an interesting, mysterious read, even more, I think, because it is inconclusive and the Hills themselves were unsure what to think about what really happened. Their bizarre story did go national in the late 60s, and years later their experience was depicted in a 1975 TV movie, The UFO Incident, with James Earl Jones and Estella Parsons. Even though I really don't like alien abduction stuff, I am considering getting up the nerve to check out the movie. There is one other book that I'm almost done reading, and that is A Fine and Pleasant Misery by Patrick F. McManus. This is a collection of anecdotes about McManus's experiences camping and fishing and doing all kinds of outdoorsy things as a kid in Idaho. I am not an outdoorsy person, and I don't do any of those things, but this book is hilarious. I love it. Um, I have laughed heartily many times including in the middle of the night when I was supposed to be sleeping. I find McManus's writing delightful. It's witty, it's cheeky, it's exaggerated, perfect for these kinds of stories. It's kind of like A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson, except, well, I think it's funnier. Uh, it doesn't have an overarching plot at all, and it's not punctuated with alarming chapters about the dangers of hypothermia or the missteps of the National Park Service. I actually heard about this book from a professor who had a very, very dry sense of humor, very subtle sense of humor as well. I didn't care for his class, and I wasn't exactly a fan of him either, but one day toward the end of the semester when I guess we didn't have anything else that we were working on, he shared with us a couple excerpts from this book, and I don't know how anyone else felt about it, but I loved it. That was my favorite day of that class, reading those excerpts gave me a whole different perspective on that professor, and I've always meant to read the book for myself, and now I finally am, and it probably won't stop here. I think I will check out more of McManus's stuff. Alright, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts on any of the books that I read in the comments down below, whether you've read them yourself or you're just interested in reading them. I'd love to know that as well, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching!